I want to welcome all of you to the second evening of the 2017-18 President's Colloquy on Civil Discourse. This year's colloquy series is designed to be a three-evening conversation spread throughout the year, which convenes the Whitworth community on issues that both inform and challenge us uh, around both the opportunities and challenges associated with constructive, healthy, productive, and civil discourse on issues that so often divide us and to do so from a distinctly Christian and multidisciplinary perspective. Most recent polls reveal that few of us are satisfied with the quality of constructive dialogue within our culture and society today. Our discourse seems often to resort to the worst patterns associated with extreme polarization and tribalism. Americans report feeling increasingly disconnected to others within their schools, neighborhoods, places of worship, and workplaces, and particularly to those who don't share their religious, political, or social perspectives. Even more challenging, these same respondents, many of us, report that they lack the basic skills needed to engage others with whom they disagree, particularly on issues that are complex and divisive. The good news is, in all of this is that many of us are wanting for something more something better. What forms should disagreement take? Are there strategies that might help us as we seek to strengthen our community's ability to navigate difficult issues? Are there common pitfalls to which many of us succumb when we analyze our own or others' arguments? These are just a few of the topics that we hope to address as part of our dialogue. I was reminded recently about how controversial being disagreeable can be in contemporary culture, and how the degree of disagreeableness, if there is such a thing, can be a matter of perspective. Like some of you, I traveled downtown on January the 15th to participate in Spokane's Martin Luther King Jr. Day rally and march. As is often the case, various speakers were invited to give short remarks to remind the crowds gathered there about the values we share as Spokanites who seek to promote racial justice and equity. Also not unusual, some elected representatives were invited to offer remarks, including Kathy McMorris Rogers, US representative from Washington's 5th Congressional District. As Representative McMorris Rogers began to deliver her remarks, she was bombarded with jeers and boos from many of the hundreds gathered there that day. People around me shadow, sh uh, shouted obscenities, while others chanted slogans that were meant to silence, or at least to drown out, McMorris Rogers' statements. Others simply turned their backs to the speaker in silent protest. At the same time, many others in the audience began shouting back at the protesters, demanding that they stop and allow the congresswoman to speak unchallenged. They appealed for calm, reason and peace while also reminding some of the most vocal protesters that there were children present that day at the rally. Later in the program, some of the subsequent speakers chastised the vocal protesters for disturbing the speech. As I read news columns and op-eds in the days that followed and as I had conversations with others who were there, I realized that acceptable forms of disagreement were up for debate. Some lamented that at a rally meant to emphasize unity, some took it upon themselves to vocally disrupt the event. Still others thought that disruption and vocal dissent were acceptable forms of peaceful protest. Many were confused and wondered aloud about whether people, even those whom, with whom we might disagree, should be treated fairly and with dignity. These are indeed, indeed complex questions. Tonight's program is the second in a three-part conversation we are having this year that is shaped to allow us, the Whitworth community, to chase these very issues. Tonight's program, titled Can We Disagree Without Being Disagreeable, is meant to highlight the processes and methods, both cognitive and psychological, that give form to our disagreement. Now, Delivering our plenary address this evening is Professor Nathan King, faculty member in Whitworth's Department of Philosophy. Dr. King joined the Whitworth faculty in 2010 after earning the PhD in philosophy 
at University of Notre Dame. His research focuses on intellectual virtue, the epistemology of disagreement, and the philosophy of religion. His work has appeared in such venues as the Philosophical Quarterly, Philosophy and Phenomenal... Help me out. Phenomenological Research. Uh, Synthes and Oxford Studies in Philosophy of Religion. Dr. King has nearly completed the manuscript for his new book, The Excellent Mind, Intellectual Virtues for Everyday Life. Nate lives in Colbert with his wife, Christy, who I see here tonight, and their daughters, Lily and Adele. All of them, he assures me, outsmart him on a regular basis. Finally, as many of you know, Nate has been an important partner with me as we've organized this colloquy series, and I want to personally thank him for his expertise, creativity, and passion for this topic. Discussing Dr. King's remarks tonight are three other fabulous members of Whitworth's faculty. Sitting to Nate's right, Dr. Patty Brunix is an associate professor of psychology. She earned the BA in psychology from Hope College, the MS and PhD in psychology from the University of Oregon. Upon graduating, excuse me, upon graduation, Dr. Brunix taught at Hendricks College in Arkansas for five years before coming to Whitworth in 2007. She is a social psychologist by training with specialization in areas of emotion and social cognition. Her research focuses on hope and consumerism. Dr. Brunix teaches courses such as psychology of poverty and social class, the psychology of consumerism, and love, altruism, and forgiveness. Patty has been married to Jim for 30 years, has two sons, a daughter-in-law, and a very adorable nine-month granddaughter. Sitting to Patty's right is Dr. Nicole Sheets. Dr. Sheets is Associate Professor of English who joined Whitworth's faculty in 2010. She holds the PhD from the University of Utah and her expertise is in creative nonfiction, travel writing, spiritual writing, autobiography, literature of pilgrimage, and audio storytelling. She can also write a seriously funny tweet. I really encourage you to follow her on, on Twitter. Dr. Sheets' recent work has appeared in Christianity Today Women, G's Magazine, and Kenyan Review Online and elsewhere. Nicole reports that she is very slowly editing an anthology of creative nonfiction about the experiences at church camp, some of uh, experiences I think some of us can relate to. You should also know that she organizes one of my favorite events of the year, the This Whitworth Life event in the fall, during which various members of Whitworth's faculty, staff, and student body use creative nonfiction to tell their unique stories to our community. Last, but certainly not least, at the far end is Dr. Fred Johnson, professor and chair of Whitworth's English department. Dr. Johnson joined Whitworth's faculty in 2008. He teaches courses in 20th century and contemporary American literature, film and comics studies, and writing. As a scholar, Dr. Johnson studies the ways that storytelling can be affected by the forms a story takes. That interest has led him to write present, and publish on subjects such as the lessons PowerPoint users can take from film studies, the clever uses the band U2 makes of transmedia storytelling, and the ways that teachers of writing can take advantage of insights from comics. Fred's interest in the circulation of stories through many forms and many communities has also led him to write and teach about the ways that ideas circulate through social networks and to his development of a course on American immigrant literature in which students consider the ways that writers have imagined and spoken about the immigrant experience of entering into new spaces and new communities. Well, I know that all of you will agree that this is an outstanding panel of speakers. Please join me in thanking each of them this evening. Okay, my talk is entitled Building Better Discourse, and there's a handout going around. Um, I'll be talking through about the first two pages of that. Pages three and four you might just consider a kind of a belated Valentine's gift from me. I, I ran out of chocolate, so uh, sorry, it was the best I could do. Okay, well in preparing tonight's talk, I read a lot of articles about the state of public discourse in America today, and apparently things aren't going very well. 
After a while, I got so discouraged from all this reading I was doing that I finally decided, okay, from now on, I'm going to get all of my news from a single source, The Onion. <laughs> the first headline there that I read said this, online activists unsure about offensiveness of article, figure they'll destroy author's life, just in case. The headline is funny only because it studiously mimics real life. Our discourse has sunk so low that it's getting hard to tell the difference between sober and satirical coverage of it. Anyone connected to the internet is familiar with the spectacle of trolling, the practice of posting offensive, demeaning, or even threatening comments online. So show of hands, how many are familiar with this? Okay, so most of us. Have you seen anyone dismissed as a fascist, snowflake, bigot, SJW, loon, nut job, hippie, shill, deplorable, idiot, moron, or worse? Please take a moment and ask yourself, do I feel reluctant to discuss controversial topics online or in public? Am I uneasy when I discuss Christianity, atheism, same-sex marriage, abortion, the Trump administration, or other such topics? If you're like me, you answered yes. Maybe your reluctance stems from a fear of being punished for stating your views. Maybe you're afraid that others will criticize you before they even understand what you've said. Maybe you fear that they'll brand you with a label, with a label you'd rather avoid. Or maybe you fear that if you state your opinion, you'll be lumped together with people and ideas you disavow. I certainly fear such reprisals, and maybe if you do as well. If so, it's worth considering what we can do to make our disagreements less disagreeable. It's worth sketching a blueprint for building better discourse. And tonight, I'd like to start such a sketch. I'm a philosopher by trade, so my union card requires that I start by defining my terms and by providing at least two caveats. So, <laughs> so first, the terms. To disagree with someone, is to take an attitude toward a claim that's incompatible with the attitude some other person takes. For example, if I think that capital punishment deters crime, but you think that it doesn't, then we disagree. A milder kind of disagreement occurs when one of us believes a claim and the other suspends judgment about it. So for instance, if I'm a theist, if I believe in God and you're agnostic, you neither believe nor disbelieve, but you just kind of suspend judgment, uh, then we count as disagreeing in that case as well. Next, to be disagreeable towards someone is to express disagreement in a way that goes beyond merely stating our views. It's to express disagreement in a way we reasonably think will upset others. Disagreeableness is less about what we say than about how we say it. To avoid being disagreeable, we need not refrain from expressing our controversial views. Instead, we must ensure that whatever offense our expression causes is due to our message itself and not to the way we deliver it. All right, now the caveats. First, expressing disagreement isn't always disagreeable. Suppose you and I are talking about tomorrow's weather. You think it'll snow, I think it won't. Well, we disagree. Are you thereby dis being, being disagreeable to me just because you disagree with me? Well, perhaps not. You might express your disagreement while remaining perfectly pleasant. So I think just expressing disagreement needn't involve being disagreeable. Nor must disagreeable, uh, dis disagreement bespeak disagreeableness when we move into more controversial territory. So here's a thought experiment from philosopher Alvin Plantinga. Suppose you're a Christian. You believe that God exists that God became incarnate in Christ, that he died for our sins and rose again. You believe the doctrines outlined in the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. You therefore believe that those who deny these claims believe something false. Are you thereby being disagreeable toward these people? Suppose you're aware that many intelligent people reject your Christian beliefs. You realize that you're finite, infallible, and more than that, you're a sinner. You've studied the objections to Christianity, and you've learned a lot from them. You're not certain that you're right, but for all that, at the end of the day, 
it still seems to you like Christianity is true. When you report this to your dissenting friends, humbly but directly, are you thereby being disagreeable? Well, it's hard to see why. Uh, but if you're not, then even when it comes to topics as controversial as whether only one religion can be true, disagreement needn't involve disagreeableness. Second caveat, sometimes it's appropriate to be disagreeable. I mean, Jesus did it, after all. Recall the passage from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 2. Jesus cleanses the temple in that passage, and when he does it, he makes a scene. He drives the money changers out with a whip. He accuses them of corruption, and when they challenge him, by what authority are you doing these things, he chides them. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Jesus surely knew that his words and actions would make the temple authorities uncomfortable. By any reasonable account, he acted disagreeably. But no Christian can think that he did something inappropriate. As Jesus shows us, disagreeableness can, lead, uh, can excuse me, stem from love rather than from hatred. Such cases, though, may be rare. Other moral reformers' lives illustrate the same point. Think of Frederick Douglass, Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul, Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., William Wilberforce, and others. In their battles against oppression, all of these people were right to express their disagreement in disagreeable ways. So in some, I reject the idea that merely expressing disagreement is always disagreeable. And I reject the idea that we should never be disagreeable. Instead, I assume only the following. Given the state of public discourse today, it would be good if we could cut down on disagreeableness that doesn't serve some good end. And it would be good if we didn't automatically assume that our own favorite ends are so important that they automatically justify our being disagreeable, or that they make disagreeable speech wise. In what remains, I'll offer a few thoughts about how we might develop more agreeable, constructive discourse. And I want to start by talking about some fallacies to flee. So if public discourse were a building, the logical inferences that we make would be the support beams. And the fallacies that I want to talk about next are the intellectual equivalent of rotted timbers. If we want to rebuild our dilapidated discourse, we'll need to clear them away. So first, the ad hominem fallacy. This is the argument against the person. This fallacy attacks the individual who stated a view or argument instead of providing a rational critique of the viewer argument itself. So here's an example. Smith defends the importance of health care for the poor. But Smith is just a soft-headed red communist. So you shouldn't believe a word she says about health care. This way of thinking just attacks the person giving the view or argument. It doesn't provide any reason to think that Smith's evidence itself is unsound or that her view itself is false. It's just an intellectual shortcut around the evidence and it's a hasty judgment. Now, I suspect that the ad hominem fallacy is already familiar to you, so I'm going to move on fairly quickly to the attitude to agent fallacy, or this is sometimes called the proposition to person fallacy. This occurs when our thinking moves straight from an attitude a person takes toward a proposition, right? they believe it or disbelieve it or whatever, to a negative assessment of the person himself or herself. So here are some examples. Jones believes that abortion is sometimes morally permissible. So, Jones is a moral monster. Miller believes that the company's diversity training policies are ineffective. So, Miller is a racist. To see why this kind of thinking is bad, consider analogies. If you see a basketball player miss a free throw, you shouldn't just automatically assume that she's a bad shooter. If you see a baseball player strike out, you shouldn't immediately infer that he's a bad hitter. The fallacy is to move from a judgment about one singular performance to a judgment about that person's general tendencies or character. Seeing a single bad performance usually just gives us reason to think that the person has made a mistake on a given occasion. Now, our beliefs are like cognitive performances. Taken one at a time, they're just isolated events. Just as we shouldn't think that someone who trips once is a clumsy person, 
So we shouldn't think that someone who believes something false, or that by our lights is false, is stupid. Nor should we think that that person has bad moral or intellectual character. Well, what might we think instead? Well, perhaps the person doesn't have the same evidence that we have. Or perhaps they have the same evidence but have made a mistake in assessing it. Or maybe we're the ones who've made the mistake in assessing the evidence. All such explanations are more reasonable and more charitable than thinking the other person is stupid or corrupt. And come to think of it, don't we expect and enjoy and appreciate such ex explanations of our own mistakes, our own mistakes in evaluating evidence, and thinking things through in the wrong way? Well, if so, then maybe we should accord others the same kind of charity. All right, our next fallacy I think it's growing in popularity, at least if my Facebook feed is any indication. So here's an example. This is called the argument claim conflation. Suppose I give a Marxist critical theory-based argument for social justice, and you find my argument unsound. Then I infer that you're against social justice itself. In this case, I conflate your assessment of my argument with your assessment of my conclusion. I think you're rejecting my main point when you're really only rejecting how I got there. To make this move is for me to confuse the reasons I've given for the claim I'm trying to put forth. But such thinking ignores an important fact. There can be more than one reason for endorsing a single claim. You can reject innumerable arguments for a single claim without rejecting the claim itself. In fact, all you have to think is that there's one good reason or argument for accepting the view. One thing that's uh, pernicious about the argument claim conflation is that it leads to a lot of friendly fire. It leads members of a given group to eat their own. Do you reject any of the reasons people on your side give for their views? If so, then watch out. You might soon find yourself labeled a heretic or a deserter. This, in part, is an artifact of our culture's move toward tribalism a set of thought and speech codes that demands absolute deference to the beliefs and reasons of the group. Anyone, even a devoted group member, can be voted off the island for failing to comply. Are you a political liberal who has a few doubts about your tribe's arguments for abortion on demand? Well, be advised. Your friends may soon question your commitment to the pro-life cause, excuse me, the pro-choice cause. Are you a theological conservative who rejects the arguments for a literal reading of Genesis. Take heed. You may soon find yourself booted from church for denying that God has created the world. Now, pretty clearly, such thinking is bad for our discourse. OK, uh, one final fallacy. This is well known to most logic students. It's called the straw man fallacy. It involves attacking another person's view or argument in a way that just makes it easier to attack, right? weakening the view in order to make it easier to attack. This is like refusing to box a real opponent and setting up a punching bag instead. Of course, anyone can score a one-punch knockout on a punching bag. It's no real accomplishment. And likewise, it's no intellectual accomplishment to knock down a weakened version of someone's view. Years ago, along with a grad school colleague, I discovered a special version of the straw man fallacy. I'll spare you the technical details, but suffice it to say, the two of us felt pretty smart when we figured this out. We felt less smart when we realized that throughout our friendship, we'd been committing this fallacy against each other sort of over and over again. Here's how it went. So like many young philosophers, we set out to discern the relationship between divine providence and human freedom. You're already thinking, this is not going to go well, right? <laughs> so my friend was a Calvinist, and he was keen to protect God's providence. I was an Arminian, and so I was keen to protect human freedom. My friend ended up reasoning like this. You believe in robust human freedom, so you deny God's providence. I reasoned like this. You believe that God's providence constrains human freedom, so you must think that God's actions are the cause of evil in the world. So you believe that God is evil. Needless to say, our friendship was strained and our learning was thwarted until we learned to characterize the other person's view in terms the other found acceptable. 
that was a key step forward uh, for us. Okay, but here's the thing. All the fallacies we've talked about so far are easy to understand. They're simple enough to be grasped by freshmen and children and even philosophy professors. But despite this, they make up a sizable percentage of our discourse about controversial topics. So we've got to ask ourselves, how could these fallacies be so easy to see, but so hard to avoid? My own sad suspicion is that we may lack the motivation to resist them, perhaps because such resistance is uncomfortable. Embracing these fallacies provides fast relief from the cognitive dissonance that comes when we realize our dissenters might just have a point. If we want to rebuild our discourse, the discourse of our community, we need to resist such tempting shortcuts. Right. Next, a few thoughts about civil discourse and Jesus' love commands. In intellectual matters, no less than in other matters, the silver and golden rules apply. We have a duty not to do to others what we wouldn't want done to ourselves. That's the silver rule. And we have a duty to do to others what we would want done to ourselves. That's the golden rule. When asked to identify the greatest commandments in the Jewish law, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Our duty to love others is not rendered void when we engage in discussions of controversial topics. There are intellectual silver and golden rules. So if we think we can divorce our habits of discourse from our efforts to love others, we haven't fully grasped the implications of Jesus' words. We won't fulfill the command to love others if we serve in soup kitchens and help little old ladies across the street and then go home, crack open our laptops, and treat our online dissenters uncharitably. On the contrary, treating others well in intellectual endeavors is just part of what it means to follow Jesus' commandment in real life. Inconveniently, though gloriously, that command extends to the way we treat even our enemies. Right, so I want to talk about next some virtues to seek. So I just mentioned the silver and golden rules applied to intellectual discussions. And I was referring, in a way, to intellectual fairness and charity, two among many important intellectual virtues. As, I, as I'm using the term, intellectual virtues are the cognitive character traits of excellent thinkers. These traits involve our thoughts, our habits, our motivations, and our actions in relation to truth and knowledge. Virtuous thinkers believe that knowledge is valuable in its own right not just for the earthly goods that it delivers. They desire understanding. They feel pleased when they discover the truth and feel uneasy at the thought of believing falsehoods. And they act habitually in order to get knowledge, to keep it, and to share it with others. And here's a pertinent reminder. Civil discourse is standardly defined as discussion undertaken for the sake of knowledge and understanding. If this is right, then the goal of civil discourse is to achieve the very goods, knowledge and understanding, that virtuous thinkers want in any case. Good civil discourse and intellectual virtue are tightly linked. So with that, let's explore a few virtues that can help repair our discourse. First, intellectual humility. This is the virtue that enables us reasonably to assess our cognitive limitations or weaknesses and then to own those shortcomings by doing something about them. In the context of discourse, I'd like to suggest two possible applications for humility. First, when we discuss controversial topics, we need to bear in mind that these topics usually are controversial because they're deep and multifaceted. We're rarely aware of all the evidence that's relevant to our controversial beliefs about ethics, politics, law, religion, and even science. But if that's right, then we need to admit that there's evidence sort of out there that we don't have. Some of it probably counts against our views. Now, this needn't lead us to abandon our cherished views, 
But I suggest it should make us at least a bit more cautious and self-reflective. And here's a test. I borrow this from philosopher Nathan Ballantyne. Identify some controversial belief of yours. Right? So think of a controversial belief that you have. You got it? Now transport yourself to a library. And imagine that arrayed before you are dozens of books whose titles suggest that they attack your controversial belief. Are you nervous? If so, then you're acknowledging that those books might contain evidence against your views, right? evidence that you don't have. And you're acknowledging that that evidence is relevant to what you should believe. Okay, next step in the thought experiment. Suppose you pick up those books, you open them, you start reading through them, and you find that they're filled with blank pages or Garfield comics. Are you relieved? Well, if so, then you're admitting that the arguments you thought were in those books might have reduced your confidence in the disputed belief. When it comes to our beliefs about controversial topics, there's often a lot of available evidence that we simply don't have. This is one of our cognitive limits. Part of what it means to own this limitation, part of what it means to be humble, is to give this evidence some weight. All right, here's a second way that owning our limits is important for public discourse. And this holds whatever we say about our grasp of the evidence concerning controversial topics. I think this is true. We're surely limited when it comes to our knowledge of what's on other people's minds, right? our dissenter's minds. So suppose our dissenter supports Planned Parenthood or that he voted for Trump. We can't justifiably infer from these facts that she supports Planned Parenthood because she doesn't care about the unborn, or that he voted for Trump out of disdain for immigrants. People have all kinds of reasons for their beliefs and actions. We can't normally know what these are without asking. We're not clairvoyant. To be humble in the midst of public discourse, we must slow down, admit that we have limited access to others' minds, and begin to listen. Next, open-mindedness. This is the intellectual virtue that enables us to transcend our current perspective for the sake of learning. Right? So not for the sake of being polite, but for the sake of learning. This trait obviously rules out dogmatism and intellectual inflexibility. If we're open-minded, we won't dismiss new or alternative views without good reason. Instead, we'll be willing and able to learn from people who hold views that oppose ours or that are simply different. Now, some people get kind of nervous when we mention open-mindedness, and, and there's a worry that this virtue will lead to a lack of conviction. That's why we have this oft-repeated line, right? Don't be so open-minded, your brains fall out. But open-mindedness is compatible with confident conviction. And this, too, is reflected in our language. So we say things like this. Hey, I'm really confident in my view about, say, marriage, but I'm open to hearing counter evidence. Or, hey, I'm really sure that the canonical gospels are historically reliable, but I'd like to hear the arguments on the other side. This shows, I think, that open-mindedness is not the same thing as spinelessness. We can be very confident in our beliefs and yet remain open-minded about them. Now here's something that's easy to miss. Open-mindedness should apply not just to our beliefs about controversial topics, but to our beliefs about the people with whom we disagree. We shouldn't just be open-minded to evidence when it comes to our beliefs about, say, God or morality or politics. We should be open to changing our views about theists and atheists, pro-choicers and pro-lifers. We need to acquire the first instinct of Abraham Lincoln. Some of you will know this story. As it's told, one of Lincoln's aides, over, uh, one of Lincoln's aides was uh, talking about some person of whom Lincoln had a, a bad first impression. And Lincoln overheard this aide talking and kind of thought about it for a moment and then said, I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. That's a good first instinct for us to try to develop. Firmness. A moment ago, I argued that open-mindedness needn't lead to our becoming wishy-washy. Another reason to think this is that in the fully virtuous mind, open-mindedness will be complemented by the virtue of firmness. Whereas open-mindedness leads us to transcend our own perspective, firmness enables us to maintain that perspective. 
if we're intellectually firm, we won't tend to give up our convictions at the first sign of trouble. We won't give up our beliefs without first being given good reasons for abandoning them. We won't change our views to fit the current intellectual fashion. So if we're open-minded and firm, I think, we'll avoid both these vices, dogmatism and spinelessness. Finally, a word about intellectual perseverance. This is the virtue that enables us to overcome obstacles to our getting, keeping, and sharing knowledge. Now, among those obstacles are things like distractions, things like our own limits, our blind spots, the sheer difficulty of our tasks, discouragement from others, oppression, and freezing cold weather that tries to keep us from preventing, uh, keep, prevent us from, uh, you know, attending colloquy sessions. The task ahead of us is difficult. To do public discourse well, we have to avoid treating others as we wouldn't want to be treated. That's fairness. We have to treat others as we would want to be treated. Charity. We have to acknowledge our own intellectual limitations. Humility. We have to transcend our own perspective. Open-mindedness. And we have to maintain that perspective unless given good reason to abandon it. That's firmness. Further, we've got to do all these things while our cherished beliefs are on the line, and thus while we feel ill at ease. Good public discourse requires all of these virtues because it requires us to perform well in so many different spheres of activity, and each sphere corresponds to its own virtue. I think there's a, a little diagram on your handout there that illustrates this. Right? Um, the way these spheres overlap in public discourse partly explains why the activity is so challenging. It requires us to do lots of individually challenging things all at once. It thereby shows that in order to achieve our goals in this area, we'll require a lot of perseverance. For perseverance is just the virtue needed to encounter and persist in difficult intellectual tasks. If we want to build better discourse, we should prepare for long and heavy labor. The difficulty of all this, I think, also underscores the importance of grace. Because it's so hard to build and maintain virtuous discourse, we shouldn't be surprised to find others making mistakes, running afoul of virtue, or even running headlong into intellectual vice. This will be disappointing. But unless we have reason to think that we ourselves are somehow special, we should expect that we'll make mistakes too. How, I wonder, will we want people to respond when we do? And what does that say about how we should respond to their mistakes. There's a genuine opportunity here. Our public discourse is utterly graceless. If Christian communities like ours can demonstrate grace in the midst of honest, earnest, controversial discussions, the secular world is sure to sit up and take notice. But here's the problem. If the state of our discourse, even our discourse, is any indication, Many of us don't have the virtues needed to express grace in the midst of controversy. Or maybe we don't have these virtues to a sufficient degree. But plausibly, if we did, and I include myself, our discourse would be in much better shape than it in fact is. If we want to build better discourse, we'll need better carpenters. If we want to improve our discourse, we'll need to improve the intellectual character of the people doing the talking. And I'd like to talk for just a couple of minutes about some next steps we might take in that direction. It'd be comfortable to begin by pointing out others' flaws. But if we do this, we'll find the proverbial three fingers just pointing back at us. So a while back, my daughter Lily, she's nine years old, was pointing out a flaw in her younger sister, Adele. And she was going on and on about her sister's flaw. I thought, oh, this is a good opportunity. So I explained to her the classic one-finger, three-finger dilemma. And I thought this would be a life-changing moment for her. I thought, oh, the light bulb will go on. You know, surely she'll be a much more gracious person from here on out. But instead, she just kind of furrowed her brow, kept accusing her sister, and then pointed at her with all five fingers <laughs> pointed in the same direction. Well, Lily's cleverness aside, I suggest that we do start with ourselves in reforming our intellectual character. Alexander Solzhenitsyn considers our temptation to place all of the good people on our side, 
and all the bad ones on the other. Here are his famous words. If only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. The same is true, I suggest, when it comes to our intellectual character. It's not like all the smart, humble, honest, open-minded folks are on our side of a given issue, and all the stupid, lying, arrogant dogmatists are on the other. Instead, we probably all have elements of all these traits within ourselves. So suppose we want to reform our own intellectual character. What should we do? Here are a few suggestions. And, and as much as I'm a professor, I'd like for you to kind of consider these your homework. But to make things fair, I'll do them too. I, I need them. So first, we can regularly remind ourselves of the kind of intellectual character we want to have. There are some reminders geared toward classroom and online discussions on your handout, but these are just examples. Right? You can make your own. Maybe these are going to be geared to your own, uh, suit, uh, your own particular activities or activities to, toward which you're suited. But in any case, there's empirical evidence that these kind of reminders really work. In one study, when participants regularly read the Ten Commandments, this drastically reduced their tendencies toward cheating on academic assignments. Second, we can find role models, people whose stories display in vivid detail what it looks like to be intellectually courageous, humble, open-minded, persevering, and so on. Like nothing else could, these stories enlarge our vision of having an excellent mind. And there's a palpable difference between just telling yourself to be more intellectually courageous on the one hand, and imagining Martin Luther King Jr. crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge on the other. Narratives teach us what intellectual virtues look like in action. And they provide inspiration as we seek to improve our own intellectual character. Third, we can choose our situations wisely. Do certain situations tend to bring out the worst in my thinking? Does a certain blog regularly lead me to think in unfair or uncharitable ways? Am I simply unable to talk about a given topic without getting angry? or without thinking that those who oppose me are morons. This could be a sign that my intellectual character is not mature enough for the situation that's giving me trouble. If such a possibility rings true in your case, consider humbly admitting that you're not ready for the difficult situation and take a break from it. Maybe with some additional training, you and I will be better prepared in the future. In the meantime, we can develop our intellectual character by training on less difficult tasks. Training, I think, is the key word. Just possibly, a lot of our failures in intellectual discourse stem not from a lack of trying, but from a lack of training. Imagine you find yourself stepping up to the plate at a Major League Baseball game. Your job is to get a hit and help your team win. The trouble is, you have only your current baseball character to rely on your current abilities, tendencies, and so on. You might try very hard to get a hit, but you're just not trained to do it. You haven't taken the batting practice, instruction, and physical training needed to get a hit in that situation. You'll probably strike out, and so will I. We might be in a similar situation when it comes to civil discourse. We find ourselves facing a difficult, difficult task, but our intellectual character is not yet suited for it. If so, then we'll need to practice. We'll need to identify the kinds of things that virtuous thinkers do and then begin to do them. There are a few sample exercises on your handout. Um, you can feel free to try these or just use them as a way to generate your own exercises. But the main thing is for us all to start doing something that challenges us to grow toward intellectual virtue. And you do that by doing something intellectually virtuous. As Aristotle says, the things we have to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them. Of course, we shouldn't think that we can shore up our crumbling discourse just by implementing this four-point plan or any other plan. I claim only that these practices can help us to make progress toward reconstruction. And given the current state of our discourse, 
even mild progress would be something for which to be grateful. To fully rebuild our discourse, I suspect, will require divine assistance. We'll need a contractor whose wisdom and resources exceed our own. For that, I suggest we look to the one who raised his own temple after three days in the grave. Thanks. I'd like to begin by referring back to the quote by Abraham Lincoln that Nate referenced. I do not like this man. I need to get to know him better. In the next few minutes, I hope to provide insight into why our ability and desire to get to know him better is in peril. Social psychology offers us a plethora of theories as to the cognitive and motivational ways in which we dismiss the other. My union card, which I do not have on me because I'm wearing a dress, would have me define terms such as the fundamental attribution error, the outgroup homogeneity bias, the confirmation bias, cognitive dissonance, and the backfire effect, among others. Each of these constructs and their associated theories provides insight into why we don't give the other the same respect as we give ourselves and those close to us. But there's another theory I want to focus on that gets at the extreme level of disagreeableness we currently see in our culture. It comes from Robert Sternberg, professor of human development at Cornell University and past president of the American Psychological Association. It is based on his triangular theory of love. And if you have the handout, you can find the diagram on that. In this theory, the vertices of the triangle represent the three components of love, intimacy, passion, and commitment. Different types of love are identified by the strength of each component. At the top of the triangle, you have intimacy. And if you have just that, then you like the other person. If only passion exists, you are infatuated with the other. And commitment alone describes a person who is determined to stay involved with the other, even if that feeling of love is absent. If intimacy and commitment are present, but not passion, you have companionate love. This is often found in couples who have been together for a long time, where the passion has been replaced with deep affection and commitment. If only intimacy and passion are present, then you've got you some good old romantic love. And if passion and commitment are present, but not intimacy, you have fatuous love, ex exemplified by a whirlwind courtship and marriage. If you're lucky enough to have all three, then welcome to consummate love. It is the ideal relationship towards which people strive. OK, so what does all this love talk have to do with being disagreeable? Well, the same components that make up love can also be seen in hate. The only difference is that instead of intimacy being at the top of the triangle, we find negation of intimacy. This isn't the same as having the components of passion and commitment, but not intimacy, which you see in fascist love. Negation of intimacy involves a seeking of distance, as opposed to seeking the closeness that occurs with intimacy. This means there is a deliberate refusal to be intimate with the person. This could be based on past experiences, Perhaps you've had a falling out with that person. Or maybe you've been taught that a person with particular characteristics, whether they be race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, or political persuasion, do not warrant intimacy. In any case, negation of intimacy means you are not making an effort to know the person, but rather are intentionally avoiding any interaction with him or her. Whereas intimacy leads to feelings of liking and closeness, negation of intimacy can lead to feelings of repulsion and disgust. Passion and commitment still make up the other two vertices, but because there is now no intention to have a relationship with the person, these take on a different tone. Passion still contains the strong physiological sensations associated with emotion, but instead of infatuation, one experiences anger or fear. And instead of being determined to remain involved with another person, the commitment component is characterized by thoughts of devaluation and feelings of contempt. We are a culture that focuses on consumption over relationships. And this makes this negation of intimacy more insidious. One of the things we consume on a regular basis is news. However, we no longer consume the same news. 
Facts and truth are highlighted and massaged in ways that fit with our personal belief systems. The 24-hour news cycle constantly peppers us with the wrongdoings of the other. As consumers of news and social media, we might find ourselves taking a break from work or escaping the everyday malaise of life by going online in search of something, an interesting news tidbit, or even a tragic story that serves as temporary entertainment. Maybe we are looking for an opportunity to be morally outraged. Surely there is some mention of what the other side did that is morally reprehensible enough to warrant a post or tweet of our own. Let's face it, few things feel as good as righteous indignation. The problem is that all of this time spent familiarizing ourselves with current events is done in a vacuum that not only leaves out the other, it devalues and dehumanizes them. If we no longer see the other as truly human, we will have no need to consider her perspective or listen to his arguments. I realize I have drifted from disagreeableness to dehumanization, but it's because the latter feeds the former. Is it easier to see someone as less human whose beliefs and arguments are less worthy of consideration when there is no intimacy? And when we don't know someone, we come to fear them. This becomes a downward spiral. As Henry Nouwen states, fear makes us move away from each other to a safe distance. Fear does not create a space where true intimacy can exist. As our culture has grown materially and technologically, the distance between us has also grown. Our online world increasingly provides ways to avoid face-to-face -face interaction. An exploration of this phenomenon is beyond the scope of this talk, and I have already drifted far enough, but the point being that increased anonymity allows us to wound one another from a place of fear, and often without consequence. Not knowing a person makes perspective taking more difficult and lashing out easier. Not only is it more difficult to understand the other's argument, there is no motivation to try. The good news is that we don't have to be stuck in our current predicament. Sternberg points out that love changes over time. Romantic love eventually becomes consummate love, or it may disappear, moving outside of the triangle altogether. The same can happen to hate. By working toward intimacy, and thus removing the top vertex of hate completely, the valence of passion and commitment will change back towards that of love. This takes work because it's countercultural. Benjamin Barber, when discussing the infantilization of adults, states our preference for fast over slow and its consequences. Quote, the ability to jump from one person to another whether on email, instant messaging, the cell phone, or call waiting, can detract from the kind of serious one-on-one -on -one relationships that demand time, continuity of attention, and commitment. The temptation to distance ourselves from others, even those we like, seeps into every corner of our lives. So what can we do? Well, in terms of our cultural ills, one thing we can do is slow down. The season of Lent provides the perfect opportunity to do this. Something my psychology of consumerism students are currently doing is working through the book Simplifying the Soul by Paula Houston. In it, she offers daily practices and meditations to help us recognize and free ourselves from the stuff we have accumulated that suffocates all areas of our lives. One practice she proposes is to spend time with a friend in silence. Another is to go through the day without checking your phone. Fortunately, students are not being graded on how successful they are in their attempts. The hope is that by taking a step back from our noisy world, we can improve our relationships with others and with God. Meaningfully interacting with those people for whom we feel disgust and contempt is more difficult. It takes courage to reach out and risk rejection by the other. Remembering that everyone is a child of God can be difficult. But by looking at the other as such, we can come to know our commonalities as well as the other's unique strengths. Only by attempting to see the other as worthy as ourselves can we get to a place of taking their perspective, gaining insight into the experiences that have shaped them and their accompanying beliefs. Learning to see negation of intimacy or dislike of the other 
as a call to move toward rather than away is what Lincoln implied when he said, I do not like this man, I need to get to know him better. Resisting the temptation to devalue the other, even when his or her beliefs seem off the wall, goes against every natural inclination we have as human beings. This is why it takes practice, as Nate communicated earlier. My hope is that this evening's discussion will push all of us in the direction of negating the negation of intimacy. May we find a place where intimacy makes us able and motivated to treat the other with respect, whether we agree or disagree. Thank you. I have also been thinking about Abraham Lincoln, but I have no diagram and no union card. In a short story called Where Are the Nine, Martin Bell revisits the gospel account of the 10 lepers healed by Jesus. As you recall, in Luke, Jesus heals 10 lepers, but only one returns to thank him. The takeaway is usually something like, 90% of people are ungrateful, so don't be that way. But in his reimagining of the story, Martin Bell asks, quote, how about a word or two on behalf of the nine lepers who did not return to give thanks? He writes, quote, it's simple, really. One of them was frightened, that's all. He didn't understand what had happened, and it frightened him. So he looked for some place to hide. Jesus scared him. A second was offended because he had not been required to do something difficult before he could be healed. It was all too easy, Bell explained, and so Jesus offended him. The third person, quote, did not know what to do or how to live or even who he was without his leprosy. Jesus had taken away his identity. The fourth, quote, did not return because of his, in his delirium of joy, he forgot. He forgot, that's all. He was so happy that he forgot. Bell imagines that the fifth leper was unable to say thank you anymore to anybody. The sixth, long separated for, from her family, did not return to give thanks because she was hurrying home. Near the end of the story, Bell reminds us that condemnation is easier than investigation. I first heard Bell's story in a sermon, and the priest summed it up this way. It's easier to judge than to investigate. I've been thinking about this story in light of our question tonight. How do we disagree without being disagreeable? The question affirms that disagreement is and will be with us, not just on small things, but on high-stakes issues that affect us so deeply. As Nate has already mentioned, and as I anticipate we'll talk about more tonight, being disagreeable isn't always something to be avoided, and we likely have varied ideas about what disagreeable even means, or what it looks like, or how it might apply differently to faculty and staff as opposed to our students. A question I keep hearing underneath tonight's official question is, how do we live with disagreement? How do we stomach it? And in some ways, I mean stomach quite literally. By both nature and nurture, I'm someone who tends to avoid disagreement. I feel my throat close up or my stomach start to roil when a room gets tense. I tend to be a smoother overer. That's a technical term. And it's taken me a long time to realize that smoothing things over is not peacemaking. But that's likely uh, another essay. How do we, as a Whitworth community, live with disagreement? One answer is that we investigate. We ask good questions in good faith. Nate has already covered many elements of a good faith discussion, such as intellectual virtues like humility and fairness. Good faith means we're treating others as we'd like to be treated. It requires a measure of trust. We see it in our classes, or at least we hope to see it there. When I tell students that I'm not grading them on their ideology, but I'm evaluating how well they've researched the issue and how well they've considered their audience and supported their claims, I need them to believe me. 
How do we establish rapport and build trust with others on campus beyond the relatively captive audience of a classroom? I don't know what that will look like for you, but for me it means taking care of the relationships I have. It means recommitting to meeting newer faculty and staff. Faculty Scholarship Forum is one space where these kinds of relationships have started and grown for me. And I've wondered if there might be some kind of lunchtime discussion where people from different parts of campus could meet to discuss potentially divisive issues. I'm also mindful of my busy calendar, which I'm sure is much like your busy calendar. And I ask myself, as a more introverted person, do I really want to spend my precious lunchtime to talk with people, including some near strangers, about Planned Parenthood, or the definition of marriage, or protections for LGBT faculty and staff, or guns, or climate change, or other softball topics? <laughs> Related question, would free and endless breadsticks from the dining hall sway my answer? <laughs> to be determined. How do we live with disagreement? We're building good faith in our relationships on campus, and we're also asking good questions. The writing I do edges closer to journalism than to literary criticism. When I'm doing an interview, I get to ask all sorts of questions, often the open-ended kind, that I hope will draw somebody out, will get them to speak in a more detailed way, maybe nudge them off script, not as a trap, but to take our conversation somewhere besides a foregone conclusion, to make room for surprise. If I disagree with someone or suspect I disagree with someone, I'd like to approach them as a person I might write about. If this is my stance, then I'm not trying to persuade them, but I'm trying to understand. I could ask questions like, what has led you to this conclusion? What has been influential in your thinking? Has this issue affected you personally or someone you care about? And could you talk about that? Have you ever changed your mind about an important issue like this? And what caused the change? I confess that this exercise is more of an intention than a habit for me at this point. How do good questions allow us to live with disagreement? They do lots of useful things, but let me mention three. First, asking a question gives me a moment to pause, to collect myself. If I ask a question and wait, I am not talking. In the first session of this colloquy back in October, Karen Peterson Finch reminded us that if we want to speak the truth in love, she said, we have to stay calm to reason well. For me, a question and the silence that follows is a way to stay calm in my body and to take a breath and listen. Second, good questions can strengthen a relationship strained by disagreement. They're a way to keep the door open. For example, a childhood friend of mine voted differently than I did in this last presidential election. And for a while, her Facebook made my eyes hurt. And I suspect that feeling was mutual. When my friend and I finally made time for a conversation, we talked about a lot of things, including the election. I wish I could say that I had the perfectly curated list of questions ready for her. But even in my clumsy and roundabout way, I heard her reasons for voting as she did. Rather than making me angry, that conversation reminded me of our shared history and the common ground between us. I'll be honest that I still felt sad that we came to such different conclusions, but if I'd only relied on Facebook, which is never a good idea, I might have thought that the election would cost me a dear friend. The third and last thing I'll say about good questions is that they make room for stories. It will shock no one that an English professor thinks stories are important. Perhaps with the exception of allegory, stories allow for complex characters both the fictional kind and the non-fictional ones in our lives. We are characters shaped by all kinds of formative experiences. We navigate our competing loyalties. A story can help us push against the temptation to label or judge. As Martin Bell reminds us, if we dismiss the nine-heeled lepers as ungrateful or lazy, 
we're flattening the miracle. When we find someone with whom we disagree, how easy it is to turn away or to tune them out, and how life-giving it could be to say, tell me more. Thanks. So I called this uh, Against Eloquence as I was writing it. I'm wondering if I should reconsider it and call it Three Cheers for Awkward Impertinence and Irrelevancy. I'm still working on that part. Uh, this is how it goes. Uh, in a Saturday Night Live skit last month, the chit-chat of three fashionable couples at dinner skids to a halt when one diner brings up a recent highly ambiguous Hollywood sex scandal. The skit's pretty good joke is built around the fact that they are all uncomfortable with the implications of the scandal, but unwilling to risk unpacking those implications, lest they defy the tangled and contradictory conventional wisdoms of their social set. Every person at the table begins a sentence boldly, but trails off in shame at shushing signals from one or another of their gathered friends. It's funny, and it's painful, and it distills for comedy what it feels like to live and think in a community where speaking with absolute carefulness and propriety, speaking with the squeaky clean manners of the moment, is given greater importance than speaking in ways that challenge, illuminate, enrich, embolden, or otherwise complicate the reigning moods and mentalities. I'm interested tonight in the inciting moment of that skit where one friend violates a taboo by innocently broaching an uncomfortable topic at an inopportune moment in a way that makes jaws drop. In the comic world of the skit, she eventually uses sorcery uh, to make herself disappear, a metaphor for the immense pressure this subject put on her unprepared friends and their friendships. In our real lives, the ineloquent misspeakers and the inelegant blurters, my people, I want to say, often face less magical forms of disappearance. They're blamed or condemned or given the cold shoulder or seen as obnoxious nuisances. Sometimes, to be sure, they are obnoxious or unhelpful. But I want to pursue the notion that we need them, absolutely must have them, to help us see behind the carefully curated facades of fashionable right thinking. And that if we build a community where exuberant or careless ineloquence is a matter for censure, if we habitually greet awkward and inopportune speech with anger and punishment, then we are working together against that which might otherwise challenge, attune, and deepen our knowledge and wisdom. The novelist E.L. Doctorow drew what I think is a relevant distinction between what he called the language of regime and the language of freedom. Regime language, Dr. O says, draws its strength from what we are supposed to be when we're playing by the rules. When we are awed to silence or moved to careful speech by our loyalties to the attitudes, platitudes, and angers of those whose power and whose ways of thinking we admire, fear, or simply accept. To be sure, there is nothing necessarily wrong with speaking up and acting out from within one's polite, well-curated, easily recognized cultural space. Laudable results often follow from obedience, propriety, and manners. But sometimes, the loyal marchers ought to be irritated out of their self-assured propriety. Toward that end, Dr. O's language of freedom nettles, challenges, and inspires. The language of freedom arrives on the scene askew from polite expectations, and Dr. O says, it will always trigger fashionable angers. He also says, though, that this language is where we become, meaning, I think, that this is the speech that gets us to new thoughts and exposes submerged possibilities and brings to light unexamined problems. It is speech that illuminates, enriches, emboldens, or otherwise complicates our lives. And it is not simply the language of contrarian opinion or the rhetoric of protest marches, which can turn out to be very much part of the standard world of polite speech and action. Dr. Rowe connects the language of freedom to art and particularly to his own work as a novelist who arranges facts and history and human activity into eccentric but telling new shapes. Successful art for Dr. Rowe, as for me, is often a source of challenge to conventional thinking and received habits of mind, heart, and action. An elegant act of art may turn out to be, in a given context, a piece of rude and disruptive ineloquence, a rock thrown through the windows of common complacency, or maybe that metaphor is too aggressive. I'm not really talking about revolutionary action here. Maybe successful art turns out to be the look of gentle disapproval, or the note of skepticism, 
or the stunning counterexample that leads us to rethink our ways. And I want us to consider the possibility that rude, awkward, unpolished, inopportune, and unexpected speech can work like art if we let it. Offense and irritation can lay the foundation for sincere head-scratching, hypothesis, and conjecture, creating new impetus for the rigorous imaginative inquiries into truth and knowledge that we champion in universities. Of course, impolite and rude speech can also be just impolite and rude. That makes it difficult to cope with at times. But I want to offer four questions we can ask ourselves when we encounter ineloquence of all kinds. These questions, I hope, will help us to be more agreeable in our disagreements and perhaps to benefit mightily from speech and actions that could otherwise lead to the explosion of personal relationships or the fracturing of community. And question one is, am I picking at specks? Matthew 7 gives us Jesus' famous lines about specks and planks, and they are central to my defense of rude and ineloquent speech. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, Jesus asks, and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? Jesus calls the speck pickers hypocrites, and he warns them to get their own eyes clear of debris before poking their fingers into anyone else's. That's a metaphor about judging others, of course, and without unpacking the subtleties of Christian doctrine on judgment and forgiveness, I think I can say that we of the social media era run the daily risk of becoming a ghoulish army of speck pickers hovering over the speech of the world, fingers at the ready. What this looks like to me most often is a high-tech variation on bullying, making the targeted person suffer helplessly for any exploitable move or infelicitous word, treating casual gestures and spontaneous speech with the kind of opportunistic, self-interested parsing and nitpicking that gives unscrupulous lawyers a bad name. If your pursuit of justice has you treating people around you as if their speech is court testimony to be relentlessly prodded and critiqued, if your idea of conflict resolution is that everyone else should have their houses forcibly put in order, if your mind is bent more on the correction of others than on mastery of yourself, then you may be falling on the wrong side of this metaphor. You should at least consider that possibility with a bit of fear and trembling. It is obnoxious when our news media fill their 24-hour drip feed with petty over-analysis of speech, eviscerating the spirit and intention of the speakers they target, but it is deadly to our communities when we do that to one another. For our trouble, we end up with gutted and suffering communities of prudes and censors and hypocrites, incapable of asking or hearing important questions about themselves, or of listening to, its import, to, to important misspeakers and taboo breakers who've been pummeled into silence. Question two is, am I silencing the moderates? Our country's major comics publishers chose in the middle decades of the 20th century to self-censor, submitting their work to an approval process that kept their publications safe for kids. The development of visual storytelling was actually held back a number of decades as a result, but not in every way, and not in every place and time. The 60s counterculture folks in particular developed an underground comics subculture taking advantage of affordable printing and an emerging network of head shops to distribute their work. It's an interesting story about art finding a way, even when mainstream culture tries to hold it back. But the work of these artists and writers is often really, truly, very intentionally, absolutely offensive. Even half a century later, much of it looks and is extreme, though some of those artists have gained respectable mainstream notoriety over time. So notice what happened and what we lost. Hordes of right-thinking people looked at comics and said, well, they have to be tamed and contained. But art and profound rudeness found a way to get out from under that forced regime, as it often does. The underground comics artists inspired many readers and followers, and they can, and they can be credited with moving forward their art form. But it is a shame, still, what we missed out on during those decades of suppression, as we demanded that visual storytelling on paper should exist primarily for children. And what I wonder is what we might have had from those decades if the form had been able to develop more naturally and openly, taking on subjects and aiming for audiences less interested in costumed heroes and more interested in artful storytelling of all kinds. Likewise, what do we lose when we silence or intimidate all but the most acceptable speakers? What damage do we do to ourselves and our own self-knowledge when we cultivate communities where only those who are intentionally, excessively, or cluelessly shocking will dare to speak? What disaster are we risking when our moderate voices won't offer us gentle critiques for fear of being eaten by the waiting wolves? We need, I think, 
to learn to hear and respond to the moderate dissenters, or else we are building a world for the screaming extremists. Question three, have we made space for neurodiversity? Our improving public conversation about individuals on the autism spectrum has included sympathetic and helpful talk about how to help those individuals live well, and has led to the telling of surprising and inspiring stories about people with autism whose unusual minds have been indispensable assets to their lives and their work. One side effect of increased awareness has been a bit of speculation about autism spectrum symptoms and famously difficult or eccentric geniuses of the past, such as Einstein, Mozart, and Newton. That kind of speculation is always inconclusive. Sir Isaac Newton's taciturnity, bad temper, and obsessive work practices may or may not indicate that he was living somewhere on the autism spectrum. But such speculations, along with uh, real contemporary stories, continually suggest that the very qualities which have made some of our most brilliant minds so remarkable have also caused their remarkable interpersonal difficulties. They've often spoken rudely at inopportune moments in unwelcome ways. In his book, Neurotribes, Steve Silberman says that neurodiversity refers to the notion that conditions like autism, dyslexia, and attention deficit disorder should be understood not simply as cognitive deficits or dysfunctions, but as naturally occurring cognitive variations, each one with distinctive strengths that have contributed to the evolution of technology and culture. The neurodiverse see and say things differently than most people do. That can be a great hardship. It can also be a source of amazing insight or accomplishment, however, the neurodiverse are clearly at a serious disadvantage in any environment where speaking out of turn, failing to use the right words at the right time, or just being eccentric and a bit ill-mannered are reasons for severe censure. I want us to think not only of the individual with autism, but also about, for example, the first-generation college student with ADD and no clear idea about how to follow social rules her peers were acculturated into from childhood. Such individuals are very likely to tell us something new about ourselves or recast old questions in new and unexpected ways. They are strangers who can shed new light on our daily lives and practices. But we will never learn from them if we reject them outright for speaking out of turn or breaking the rules of prudence as they try to put what they have in mind into word and action. We have to give them a break, I think. We have to give a similar break to all eccentrics. And we have to realize that there are eccentricities in everyone if we can make space for the neurodiverse and the eccentrics, we will hear and learn things that would otherwise be lost to us. The last question, question four, is kind of academic. Are we offering well-backed claims and allowing our claims to be scrutinized? In university culture at its best, we make informed claims backed by reasons. We submit our claims and their reasons to scrutiny, and then we scrutinize the scrutiny, all in order to make better claims backed by better reasons, which we will then submit to scrutiny. So on. Each academic discipline has its own strategies for gathering evidence and forming claims and questioning claims so that a well-rounded student ought to leave school with a number of different ideas about how uh, to either form or encounter an unusual claim and then test it. Those disciplinary strategies can guide our responses to eccentric and unusual speech, helping us sometimes to assent to and sometimes to push back on that speech. They can provide us with ways to include all kinds of voices in our debates, even awkward seeming ones. These tools can help us form communities where awkward or unexpected speech is met with lively scrutiny and response rather than horror, disavowal, or punishment. It does take some spine to embrace the rude voices, to allow all voices to speak and become part of that process of making claims and subjecting claims and reasons to scrutiny. It sometimes takes an effort of will to accept impolite voices that speak out of turn. Every era has its committed Puritans who try to shackle art, suppress misspeakers, punish the ineloquent, and pressure others to do the same. History and experience show us art is not always free, that it can be tethered to regime, and that demands for art to obey, to speak the party line and reinforce authorized lessons will always be with us. But so too will the persistent, if sometimes cowed or beat down, language of freedom. We can learn to welcome, forgive, and even benefit from rude, inopportune, or upsetting eruptions from the language of freedom, which has its risks, but also has a way of leading us toward epiphanies. We can even forgive the way that language of freedom sometimes speaks rotten foolishness, knowing that we have many adequate means for testing and countering claims, for dividing wisdom from folly, and for welcoming imperfect utterances. Thank you all, and uh, I know that we're going to be collecting some question cards, Ruth uh, and Will, 
are walking around doing that. Um, while they're doing that, I want to take the advantage uh, opportunity to ask the first question, and I think I'll ask the first question to Dr. King, and that is to allow you the opportunity to respond to any one of the, the responses that you heard. Nate? Well, thanks. There are a lot of things to respond to. I thought those were incredibly rich talks, so I'll, I'll just sort of scratch the surface here. I was struck by a, a kind of parallel between Patty's talk and Fred's on, on this one point of ways in which certain habits of ours can keep us from hearing the whole story about a given issue. So Dr. Brunix mentioned intimacy and how if we avoid it, we end up avoiding conversations with people with whom we might disagree. What happens there at an intellectual level is that when we avoid intimacy with those with whom we disagree, we're avoiding evidence. We're going to end up in a situation where we, we only have part of the story. You might have seen some of these articles recently on echo chambers, and this is exactly what happens. Right? People only hear one side of the story because they only get their news from one venue or something like this, other than you know, maybe The Onion. Um, this leads us to have a biased evidence base. But Fred, what you're talking about seem, can lead us in that direction as well but from the outside. So the intimacy, right, and our unwillingness to seek it, that's kind of on us, that's from the inside. But then these external pressures can also lead us to silence ourselves, um, which can, can lead to situations where people have um, just biased evidence bases. It can lead us to a point where our whole intellectual life is like one long experiment with a biased sample. Um, I was struck by Nicole's comments about how it's easier to judge than investigate. Um, and by the, the story of the nine lepers, I was trying to find parallels um, when it comes to our own disagreements with others, right? How can we engage in that kind of imaginative sympathy to explain others' disagreements in ways that, that don't involve kind of making bad claims about others' character or their, um, their behavior? Those were some initial thoughts, but I want to get to the questions from the audience. This is a question for Dr. King um, regarding working assumptions. How might we determine the disagree disagreeableness that doesn't um, serve some good end? Let me read that again. How might we determine the disagreeableness that doesn't serve some good end? We might disagree about the goodness of that end. Yeah, of course, there, there's going to be a lot of disagreement about which ends ought to be sought. And I don't have any kind of general panacea for uh, right, solving that, uh, that kind of ill. That disagreement's going to remain with us. Uh, what I was trying to suggest is that we shouldn't automatically assume that the goods we want to pursue automatically justify our being disagreeable. Right? So um, I'm not going to be able to solve uh, all debates about which ends ought to be sought. I think we have at least some broad agreement about which ends are worth seeking. But I was hoping to put the emphasis on, uh, on ourselves and the, the kind of speed with which we immediately jump to being disagreeable when we think we've got a good cause. Now, sometimes that's justified. Maybe sometimes it's not. But I think we ought to at least give ourselves some space to, to ask that question. This question is for uh, anyone on the panel. Who gets to determine what is disagreeable? The speaker or the listener? I'll take a crack at it. So try this on for size. If it doesn't fit, I have a no hassle return policy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the way I was thinking of it is that we're disagreeable if we speak in such a way that we not only express our claim, but do that in a way that we have reason to think will lead to offense on the other person's part that goes beyond whatever offense might have been caused by or just stating our view. So putting it that way, I guess it's, it's reason that decides. It's not you or me, right? But it's, it's reason that ends up deciding you know, whether a disagreement as it's expressed, is, is disagreeable. So that's a first thought. Others of you? 
I was going to say, where it comes to ideas or conversations about ideas, if somebody in the conversation is speaking in a way that makes the conversation stop or keeps it from getting towards anything new, uh, then there's a kind of a disagreeableness that's not serving the ends that supposedly we agreed on, right? Which is, that, like, are we having this conversation so you can tell me what you think, or are we having this conversation so that we can learn something from each other or come to a new conclusion? Uh, so if the end is to come to a new conclusion and somebody in the conversation is deliberately shutting it down or deliberately making it so the other person can't speak, it seems like it's, it's gone to a place where disagreeableness is not very useful. Um, so that might be part of an answer. I wonder too if um, if that's another panel to be had about um, you know to I think with like with our campus community right what is a disagreeable action is a is a peaceful protest to a speaker who comes is that disagreeable for us uh, you know what is what is the Whitworth way I, I, if I had had an answer I would have written my paper on that but I I was very struck by uh, Beck's opening invocation of, of the Kathy McMorris Rogers appearance at the MLK march, because I think there's at least, again, I, I did not expect to talk about Facebook so much, but I am. Um, but there was, a, I followed these threads of like, was it appropriate? Was it disagreeable? Was it productive to turn your back? Or was it productive to shout? Was it productive to shout the shouters? Um, I would say one difference with our community is, is that, it, I wonder if it would make a difference if the representative for example, had regular town halls. I think part of what, what is bottled up in some of those actions is that people feel like they are not heard in any way. And I think that's not, I think that's a, something that's very different about our community. Um, how can or should we be charitable to racist or sexist claims? If intellectual or moral ch charity is to be valued, how should we or can we be charitable to racist or sexist claims? I think that the best way to do that is to, when that claim is made, instead of recoiling in horror, um, is to kind of do the, so tell me more about that. So tell me where um, you said this, this is interesting. What leads you to that conclusion or what experiences have you had that, that have you think in that particular way? Um, always communicating with the other in a way that they can hear you, um, even if they're not responding uh, in kind. I think one initial thought might be, when it comes to claims like that, maybe we shouldn't be charitable to the claims. Maybe the claims, some of them are just simply intolerable. But that wouldn't mean that we wouldn't be charitable to the people making those claims. Now, the way that charity gets expressed, I think, will be governed in part by wisdom, right? What's likely to be most effective? I, I would hope that we would want to turn someone who holds that view uh, from the view itself, and that, would, that can be part of charity, right? It's, it's profoundly unloving to let someone persist in a view that's that far from what's true and, and what's good. I think that'll be governed by wisdom. I don't see that there's going to be an algorithm there. Uh, there's a way I think that our, like our sort of our television popular storytelling doesn't serve us well for dealing with this stuff in that when the racist shows up on the TV show, he's not just the racist. He's like the racist, murderer, evil in every way person who's going to destroy. If not, you can't even have a, like a nice conversation anymore in any way, right? They're just irredeemable. Uh, and so we see that over and over in our media. That's not what mostly we're encountering, right? If we encounter people who we disagree in everyday life, we're not encountering somebody who's irredeemably evil in every way. Uh, so there might be a space to build a relationship there. Uh, maybe not a best friendship, right? Uh, but a relationship uh, and a conversation. Uh, and and that, would, that would go a lot further uh, towards reaching reconciliation than saying, well, you said something wrong. We're not talking anymore. It makes me think too of, uh, sorry, I beat you to the buzzer. <laughs> uh, it makes me think too of, of the, the idea of in, uh, intent versus effect, that it, 
can be a moment to say when, for example, one of my favorite racists, my dear departed grandmother, right, she would say something and I was like, when you say that, this is what I hear, right? Um, and, and so that seems to be maybe a way to separate the person from the idea too. Just a, maybe a couple of more questions here uh, to end the evening. From a Christian perspective, what is the role of the Holy Spirit in growing in the intellectual virtues necessary for civil discourse? At any rate, I don't see a difference between the role of the Holy Spirit in our growing in intellectual virtues from the role of the Holy Spirit in our growth in moral virtues. Uh, that's to say, we grow in moral virtues by showing up at the places where the Holy Spirit uh, happens to be. And the Holy Spirit changes us as we encounter uh, the Holy Spirit during those occasions, right? So when it comes to spiritual disciplines, we might think in terms of fasting and prayer and silence and solitude. Um, I suspect that for the Christian, when it comes to intellectual disciplines, like trying to uh, portray the opponent's view in the fairest way possible, or thinking through our own intellectual idiosyncrasies, I, I trust that the Holy, Spirit will, the Holy Spirit will meet us and transform our character in those places as well. How about the last question, and this kind of echoes uh, Nicole's admonition for a, a second panel here, um, and that is, uh, what do you see as the biggest obstacle our community, that is Whitworth University, is facing uh, in moving from disagreeable disagreement to something more fruitful. I was I was uh, with a discussion group for the honors colloquium this past weekend. So this is all uh, admitted honors student or you know uh, admitted students at Whitworth who are hoping to get the honors scholarship, uh, and they've all read an article about intellectual life at college and how that goes on and, and what they can get out of college. So we had a great conversation. Like they were really really terrific. And at one point, they started, and I didn't take them here really, they started talking about the ways that they had experienced uh, intense conversations among other high school students in class where somebody said something objectionable, somebody said something that they disagreed with, and you saw the room, they saw the room kind of split up, right? One student in particular just was talking about how she had something different to say and more subtle to say than anybody else had said, but the, the students around her were whispering how much they hated the person who had misspoken in the first place. They, and they were tearing them down, and it was, a, it was a desire to destroy a relationship based on that kind of disagreement. Um, it's a thing that I think many of our students are coming in experiencing, is that kind of social pressure around being able to have these conversations. and. Uh, teaching, cultivating an attitude among our students, among ourselves, that when somebody brings up an awkward, uh, this, was my, this is my thing, uh, when somebody brings up an, an, uh, an awkward uh, situation, an awkward question in an awkward way, there are ways to respond to that. And there are ways we can be charitable to that. And in fact, we can check ourselves. And instead of saying, oh, well, I know who you are now, we say, oh, I don't understand you, but I'd like to, right? We need to learn those ways to, to let these be moments where conversations open up and not moments where conversations shut down and relationships fracture. Um, so, so that's key. And it's not just Whitworth. I think it's, it's culture-wide at this point. And to go back to Facebook, right? Facebook is such a shallow picture of everybody. And many people, it's so strange how people get on Facebook as if they are editorialists. When I joined Facebook, I wasn't joining it for, for to like hear all of my friends try out their New York Times editorial page style, right? But so often now people, people launch in, uh, in that particular way and, and that's actually fractious to our relationships too. If all I'm seeing is your editorial page voice, right? That's, there's something missing there. So we need to not bring that. We're not tweeting it to each other. We're having a conversation. So we need to not encounter somebody's statement as a tweet that was meant to be the last word but actually as an invitation to conversation. They've risked something by saying something awkward. Maybe we can risk something by, by giving that the most charitable uh, kind of uh, response possible. That's so, I was rambling, but I hope that helped. Somebody else? Well, I, I just think the, the greatest obstacle might be wanting to be right more than we want our community to be the kind of place that, that exemplifies these virtues. At least that's the biggest obstacle for me, right? Because it's more comfortable to be able to dismiss people on the other side than it is to really seek the kind of community 
that we would all hope this would be. So I think we're all going to have to want it, and then we're all going to have to plan for it, and then we'll have to, to train for it. Well, what a wonderful evening. Would you all join me in thanking our great panelists? Thank you so much. And thank all of you for attending tonight. I want to remind you that our third and final uh, session of this year's Colloquy on Civil Discourse will be held on April the 16th, Monday, April the 16th, so please mark your calendars. That evening's conversation will be prompted by this question, how free should free speech be? How free should free speech be? And our keynote speaker that night will be Dr. Erica Salkin from Whitworth's Department of Communication Studies. Again, thank you all for being here tonight. God bless you. Travel safely.